Good afternoon, my name is Ken Houchins. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our birthday girl, uh, Nicole Hiles. Uh, Nicole's worked at Grafton since 2008. She started as a special education teacher and helped develop and expand our career in uh, technical education program. Currently, she's the assistant education administrator for the Winchester region. Um, prior to starting Grafton, Nicole worked as a in-home mental health worker for a family-based therapy service and a residential instructor for Northwest Human Services in Pennsylvania. She's a licensed special education teacher, holds a master's of arts in special education, also a master's of science in psychology, currently pursuing her doctorate in education in leadership and administration from Liberty University. Please join me in saying happy birthday and welcome Nicole. Oh, no, 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 no. All right, well, obviously, now that I've been royally embarrassed, and my face is probably all red, you get to see me stumble my way through the first presentation on treatment integrity interventions and outcomes. A lot of talk today has been on trauma, trauma approaches, trauma interventions, things that we should do to promote best practice treatment of our clients. but. How good is that treatment if we're not monitoring it and we're not doing it the way that it's designed? So that's kind of where, um, as Ken said, I'm working on my doctorate in educational leadership and my thesis dissertation is looking at treatment integrity and are we really doing what we say we're doing and are we doing it with a high level of integrity? So good luck everybody. And I'll keep it short. There's a lot of information in here so I'm gonna go fast. It's the end of the day. Feel free to stretch if you need to. All right, so of course in true teacher fashion, I've got the objectives just like everybody else. Um, you hear me when I turn away? All right, so what we're gonna talk about today is the treatment integrity. What are the barriers? Why is it difficult to achieve? We're gonna talk about the um, feedback is a part of my dissertation. Because as a supervisor, I need to make sure that my people are doing what they're doing. And I think all of us have that responsibility as clinicians, as teachers, as administrators, to make sure that our people are doing best practice in their environments. And then goal setting. You know, there's a plethora of research on goal setting, and it has been proven to be one of the impactful practices or methodologies to keep treatment integrity in line and to keep move, people moving towards a goal. All right, so our population, the research that I've found has gone pretty much across all areas, uh, general education, special education, clinical environments, and individuals with disabilities and autism. And there was one particular study that was very interesting um, regarding self-injurious behaviors and high levels of treatment integrity. Um, an interesting factoid from Solomon's 2012 study that I found was that the general education environment and the academic skills are some of the easiest interventions to implement with high levels of treatment fidelity. Special education and behavioral skills are the most challenging, which if you know Grafton, that's exactly what we do. So we're kind of fighting an uphill battle to begin with. All right, does anybody have any idea exactly what treatment integrity is defined as? Any takers? All right. I'm sorry? Fidelity to a model, correct. It's the degree of accurate implementation of treatment as aligned or expected. So you have a clinician come in, you have an ABA person come in, they've got all these great protocols, all these interventions, they want you to run them, but are you going to really be able to do that within the barriers of your environment, within the constraints of your environment? Do you have the supports that you need? So there's a couple components of treatment integrity that contribute to whether or not you're going to get high fidelity. Um, and these are kind of part of the I guess definition, but in a roundabout way. The adherence to the intervention. So an example might be, are you using the correct verbal response to a request or waiting the expected time before delivering a redirection or a demand condition? 
So are you following the steps? Are you doing them as they want you to do them? The quality of the implementation refers to whether or not the program has consistency across domains. Are all personnel that are expected to implement it, are they doing it the same way and are they following the same steps, responding the same way? It's a, a lot of generalization. Um, your exposure is your length of your time exposed to the intervention. And this is really important. When I was originally researching, I didn't think this was a big thing. But one of the biggest um, factors of treatment integrity is that it declines over time. And that's a lot of what we're going to focus on today. Um, I know when I was doing this research, I was shocked by what I found. And I'll share that with you in a little bit. Um, but I want to talk about why treatment integrity is important first. My little errors, I screwed them up, but they're going to come out. Um, all right, so why, why is treatment integrity important? One, the obvious, client outcomes, correct? So um, research-based interventions and practices. We all promote it. We all say that we do it. Federal regulations, Council for Exceptional Children, IDEA, No Child Left Behind, funding avenues, all these sources expect you to use research-based practices and interventions. Our best practice philosophy is evidence-based research. I'm going to throw some numbers out at you. It's going to shock you. Um, Hegger-Moser Hegger -Moser and Sinetti, who's a big treatment integrity researcher found, did a literature review between 1995 and 2008. They reviewed 223 studies. Of those 223 studies, 29% did not define the independent variable, and 37% of those um, discussions or research results found that they did not report treatment integrity. There's also another one of Dufresne. He cites a 2007 McIntyre study from 1991 to 2005 um, from the Journal of Applied Behavioral Analysis. So pay attention, my ABA people. More than 60% of the articles that they reviewed failed to monitor the treatment integrity. So are they really, is the research methods and practices that we're using, are they truly based on the practices and the principles that were applied as the variables in the study, or were they subject to influences from something else? With those high numbers, it's really hard to tell. So we want to make sure we have accurate interpretation of data. Is it right? Are we getting what we wanted out of the research design and the methodology that we did? Valid conclus conclusions from research, same same line. Eventually, we hope that it would lead to a change in behavior. So that's our true focus of why we want to monitor treatment integrity and make sure that our clients are getting the best treatment, because we want to reduce their treatment time. We want to get them in our doors. We want to get them out of our doors, because it's trauma. It's traumatizing to them. All right. Anybody have any idea what three weeks is? If you've looked at your handout, you might know. But if you haven't, you got a guess? This was the shocking part to me. Three weeks. That was the longest that any study had been able to replicate or get treatment integrity to remain at a high level of fidelity. So three weeks. Think about your programs. How often do you meet on a child? Within Grafton, we have 30-day progress reviews, MDTs, we call them where we meet and review interventions in child's progress or lack thereof, discharge planning, that sort of stuff. Three weeks. That doesn't even get us from month to month of our. So I know when I shared that with Lisa, when she, I approached her originally about this, not about the presentation, because she you know, suckered me into doing this on my birthday. <laughs> but um, when I showed her the research, <laughs> I showed her the research. Um, for some insight, and she was shocked by it too. And it's just, it was really eye opening to see that three weeks is the longest that, under research conditions, university conditions, applied practice conditions, that anybody had been able to get treatment integrity to remain at approximately above an 80% implementation level. Um, Hager Moser 
in Sinetti in 2013, they cite a whole host of literature from, or from 1990 to about 2005 that says treatment integrity begins to immediately decline within one day to 10 days after an intervention is designed and implemented. That, it just, I, it's crazy to me. And, you know, I'm sort of new to the field, been here for eight or nine years, but that's still just shocking to me that immediately after an intervention is implemented or expected to be implemented, the integrity goes down and we've already lost the fidelity and the expected outcomes that we're hoping to find. Um, De Janeiro in 2007 also found that when a consultant assistance and feedback was removed, treatment integrity immediately began to decline as well. So, somewhere to go, somewhere to explore. All right, so what are the barriers to effective treatment integrity? And I would actually like to change this title from training components to intervention components, but my deadline had passed, so I, wasn't, I didn't change it. Um, but I would change it to intervention components, and you'll see why. These are some of the barriers to effective treatment integrity. Your complexity of your intervention. Is your intervention too detailed, too many steps? Is it um, not specific enough? You know, if integrity, if the, sorry, if the intervention is too complex, you get an increased risk of errors being made. You get an increased risk of staff not buying in to wanting to implement the intervention because they don't understand it. It's too frustrating. It's too, too complex. Maybe the reinforcement schedule is too dense. You know, you can't be expected to implement a three-minute reinforcer for five kids and a two-minute reinforcer for the other five kids in the classroom because you're going to spend your entire day reinforcing your kids. You're not going to get your, re your instructional time in. You're not going to get all the other behavioral components and interventions like first end cards and everything else in. So you really need to look at how complex the intervention is. Implementation deficiencies is not doing all the steps correctly, missing steps, doing a step wrong, or inadvertently reinforcing a part of it. So you really need to make sure that you understand the concepts of the, of the intervention and the steps that you're expected to do. Level of support, big, this is very big because a lot of times you have clinicians, you have ABA therapists, you have licensed individuals providing training or outlining or highlighting steps for an intervention to people that maybe have a high school diploma or you know have worked 16 hours already that day and are just really overwhelmed. So you need to make sure that you have the appropriate level of support in place. You need to make sure that the trainer understands the intervention, that they can problem solve the intervention, that they can question, question and answer with the staff that they're expected to put that intervention in place for. Um, personnel requirements. You don't need to be a licensed professional to run some of the interventions that are proposed for individuals with into intellectual disabilities or autism. But you do need to have somebody qualified to provide feedback, whether it's your supervisor, whether it's a clinician or a teacher coach or somebody that understands the intervention and has a good supervisory relationship with that individual. We've all sat around tables and been told what to do, and then we walk away and we're not going to do it. My lovely little picture that came from one of my case managers, she said, nobody likes to be voluntold. Nobody wants to be told what to do. So. <laughs> so you need to make sure that the person providing the feedback has the qualifications to give feedback, understands the intervention, and that they have a good relationship or a good buy-in with the person that they're giving that feedback to. I'm not going to listen to the person in the back corner come in and tell me how to do my job because I don't know you. I don't know who you are. You can show me all the charts and all the graphs, but I'm probably not going to do it because I don't respect you and I don't know you. And we need to, as supervisors, leaders, managers, and administrators, we need to understand that with the people that we work with. Environmental factors is a huge barrier to treatment integrity, especially when you work in a group home setting or a very complex setting where you have a lot of other conflicting responsibilities that you need to make sure are completed. Um, characteristics of your school and your population, different types of interventions are effective for different populations, but they're not effective for all populations. So when you're designing your interventions, you need to make sure that they are 
applicable to the population that you're looking at, and you need to make sure that they fit the, um, the you need to make sure they fit the population as well. Um, thinking back, I got confused there, thinking back to the academic skills and the general ed population, it's a lot easier to give a more dense reinforcement schedule in an academic gen ed population than it is to a special ed population where you've got competing um, interventions and reinforcement protocols. Your level of support from your administrators, your level of retention and your turnover is a huge factor in your consistency and your treatment integrity and implementation. You put a lot, you put a lot of resources into training, which we'll see here in a little bit. You put a lot of resources into your training to make sure that they have the interventions down and that they understand them. When you have a high turnover rate, you're just wasting your resources. You're, you're throwing out all the practice, all the skill, all the time and effort that those people have dedicated to training those individuals to train somebody new. Um, plus, with consistency, you get trust. You get trust in, from your clients, you get trust from your kids, and they want to learn from you, and they learn what to expect from you, so you get further progress on their treatment whenever there's um, better retention. <clears throat> All right, so we talked about the barriers. We're gonna talk about what works. How do we overcome those barriers? All right, so we'll talk a little bit about those um, more in depth. All right, our training packages, the instruction and the performance feedback. This is your initial training. How do you get people to understand what the intervention is? How do you get them to know what knowledge you want them to know to be able to successfully carry out the intervention? Um, Dufresne, in 2012, found that with support from multiple other um, research studies, I didn't cite them all, but he was kind of the big guy for this one, that performance feedback and instruction when delivered in the context of the setting that the intervention will be run and as close to in the moment as possible was the most effective at producing change at change in behaviors and change in treatment integrity. So if you wanted to increase the teacher's use of um, positive behavior specific positive statements then you would go into the classroom, you would observe the teacher, you would give them some feedback within five minutes of the classroom, class ending, or within five minutes of the use of behavior when she should have used it to get as close as possible. Uh, direct rehearsal. Let me find my notes because this one was... All right. Direct training sessions improved integrity levels greater than baseline levels at one month out. So you had your baseline of your integrity. They monitored that. After providing direct rehearsal training, they were able to increase the integrity past the initial baseline. So direct rehearsal includes the components of didactic instruction which is one-on-one -on -one talking to each other role-playing and talking through the situations modeling the intervention modeling how it should look modeling how a student or a staff might respond it also includes coaching so you're providing feedback and problem-solving opportunities to the staff expected to run it and then immediate corrective feedback. So you're right there in the moment with them, giving them the instructions and the feedback that they need to be successful. So that's kind of what direct rehearsal means. Um, teacher coaching with performance feedback and a checklist. Having a teacher in, having an observer in the classroom with a teacher is going to help promote the teacher's use of the interventions because that person is going to serve as a stimulus to say, oh, I need to be doing something. Oh, I need to be offering you know, tangibles or oh, I need to be setting my time or not only is the observer collecting data but it also serves as a kind of a reminder for the teacher that they need to be doing those sort of things. Um, the teacher coach should be somebody that's knowledgeable about the intervention and have the ability to provide feedback to that person as well. Don't, you know, don't send an EVP into my classroom because maybe I don't know you, I know them, but maybe I don't know them, um, and expect them to give me clinical advice on an intervention that we talked about last week. 
probably not going to listen to you. A checklist has been found to be one of the effective models. It can either be a self-monitoring or an observer checklist. It's been found to be pretty effective at providing um, change in treatment integrity levels whenever it's given to the staff running the intervention. Um, this one, I really like this one. And I know the EVPs and the finance department won't like me for this one, but um, Court Manchi, Court Manchi, I don't know how you say it, but it's a new study that came out this year um, where role playing, in session training, feedback with money, and an escape contingency also improve treatment integrity. Those four elements put together. Um, this was the one that had the self injurious behavior. They trained the DSPs through the four steps of the intervention to reduce the headbanging behavior of the individual. Interesting enough, the compensation was tied to the percentage of treatment integrity implemented. So if you had a higher level of treatment integrity, you got higher pay. If you had lower level treatment integrity, you got lower pay. It's very similar to our CTE program, stipend program that we have at Grafton where 50% of your work scale and 50% of your work behavior makes up your pay. So it's very similar to that concept. Um, and they found that whenever they tied the money into the integrity, the integrity increased. So it was the only one I've been able to find that had any kind of money contingency to it, and I thought it was pretty awesome that they were able to find it. And it was a small amount of money, nothing huge, but it was pretty cool. It was a good article. Um, very, very reflective of Grafton's environment, too, with the level of responsibilities of the DSPs and things like that. This one was one of my favorite articles. Um, DART in 2012 gave teachers the option of four interventions to try out in their classroom. So they got to test drive the interventions that they liked. So they got to see if they could do it. They got to see if it fit within the classroom setting that they had. And then they allowed the teacher to pick which intervention they wanted to run. All the interventions were focused at decreasing the, be the target behavior or increasing the social behavior. And so teachers rated it as highly acceptable, it had a high social valid validity, and they really liked it. And then the integrity with the interventions was at a high level as well. I think we all have had experience with this one. Negative reinforcement in the form of avoidance meetings, or avoiding meetings. Um, so teachers that were able to avoid a consultation meeting to review and practice interventions demonstrated consistently higher levels of treatment integrity. So we've all had that supervisor that we didn't want to go meet with or do something bad at our jobs, so we did our job really well so that we didn't have to go meet with them. Same concept. If the teachers during random observations demonstrated a high level of treatment integrity, and I think they had it at above, above 80%, so any um, any demonstration of the intervention at an 80% or above level, they didn't have to have a meeting with the consultant after school to go through the steps and be retrained. Worked. It worked. It was awesome. Um, so something to remember about your training packages, they need to be knowledge-based and they need to be performance-based. Your staff need to know why they're doing what they're doing, and they need to know how they're supposed to do what they're supposed to do. There has to be direct correlation, a direct tie-in between why am I doing this and what am I going to get out of this. So keep that in mind for all you trainers out there. Um, and I, had a, I had an example for that. The other night I was working in one of the group homes and we had a client, he has a medical protocol, he recently had surgery. So he has this medical protocol where the nurse needs to come in and change his dressing within one hour of him having a bath because the dressing cannot stay wet. And so I was getting ready to go off shift and passing that information along to the overnights and saying to them, make sure you call. She said she's going to be here at 9.30 in the morning. If he won't wait for his bath until then, call the nurse before you give them the bath to give her time to get here. And the staff looked at me and said, why? Why do I have to call the nurse? Why does the nurse have to be here? Why does this bandage need to be changed? And I'm no, no medical professional by any means, but to me it really, under, it really 
reinforce the concept that our staff need to know why we put these protocols in place. They need to know why these interventions are in place. And I told her, I said, I don't know, I'm assuming because your bandage can't be wet because then it's at risk for infection. It's, it has to be done. You know, I, I basically BS my way through it so that she would call the nurse in the morning and say, you need to do it. I'm not gonna say, because you need to. I said, I think because he's at a high risk for an infection because it's an open wound and it has to have a dry, sterile bandage on it. But it really reiterated the fact that we need to make sure that our staff know the why of the interventions that they're being asked to do. And it wasn't anything complex, but it was very basic and made me think that we really gotta do better with this. All right, so the next component is the performance feedback. Um, types of performance feedback are any one of those. You can all read those, I won't go through them. Um, additionally, coaching and consultative practices. The classroom checkup checklist was a very validated, was a highly validated, socially acceptable um, observer and teacher completed checklist that looks at environmental factors, that looks at uh, intervention components, feedback type, and treatment integrity. So it really encompasses all the areas that I'm talking about today. So if anybody's interested in that, I can get you some more information on that. But I think it would be a good tool to use in the classroom if you need to worry about integrity. Does anybody here monitor treatment integrity within their programs before we go any farther? Okay, so there's a need for it. All right, so what works with performance feedback? This was probably the most prevalent type of feedback, was a graphic supplement when combined with verbal feedback. Um, and that was from Solomon 2012. Graphic supplement can be defined as anything such as a video, graph, self-monitoring, checklist, data collection forms, charts, video modeling, um, and just remember, with this statement, graphic supplement combined with verbal performance feedback, the closer you get it to the time of the behavior, such as in the classroom or in the moment of the offense where they didn't do what they were supposed to do, you're gonna have greater impact. So immediacy is important. Um, the other thing I learned personally as a leader in my own profession is that you need to individualize your performance feedback to your people. You need to know your people. You need to know how they respond. While research demonstrates that a graphic supplement with verbal feedback is the best, it might not be how your individual people respond. So you need to get to know your people, understand what works for them. I'm giving you a bunch of tools. You can use them if you want. Um, the next component is goal setting. Goal setting is interesting. Goal setting has a plethora of research on it. It's used across every organizational domain that you can imagine. Industrial, psychology, education, you know, your organizations have, we have key performance indicators, our KPIs are our yearly annual goals. Your educational plans have annual goals. We have staff development plans. I mean, everybody sets goals. What do goals do? What do they do for us? They focus our attention and they direct our efforts and they guide our behaviors towards reaching an outcome. Goal setting when attained, when you attain your goal, it produces emotional satisfaction, gives you a sense of accomplishment. Um, so think about your own achievement in the past. How have you felt whenever you've reached your goal? Has it made you feel good? Has it made you feel bad? Um, Maslow would actually put you into the fourth level of his hierarchy of needs, where it's the esteem needs. So you're getting your sense of accomplishment met, and you're working through that hierarchy of reaching self-actualization and becoming more of a you know, whole person, a transcend transcended person. It's your psychology talk there. Um, goals must be meaningful and important. Again, I go back to they have to have buy-in to them. They have to have some sort of intrinsic motivation and want to achieve them. They can't be so vague and so abstract that you know your chances of achieving them are not realistic. So when you're setting goals for your clients and you have to phrase them for your staff, you might need to say to them, 
what are you going to get out of this? Is it going to make your job easier? Are you going to have to stop holding a pad behind Johnny's head because he's bashing his head off the wall 20 times a day? If we run this intervention for two weeks, you're going to have a 50% reduction in head banging, and that's going to make your job a lot easier. So when we set goals for our clients, which is part of all of our regulatory requirements, you also have to think about how is it going to improve the staff's buy-in? What can you do to improve their buy-in and get them to want to run the interventions through setting the goals? All right, so we all know the, the five, the acronyms for SMART, the specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. But additionally, what makes a good goal? We can all write the goals, you know, Grafton writes their goals with these five components in a specific format, but what truly makes up a good goal? What makes people want to do them? They need to be perceived as easy to moderately difficult to achieve. There needs to be some hope of us getting to that goal. If you make it six months down the road and you're reducing physical, physical aggression to zero whenever he's at 200 in a day, doesn't seem realistic to me. I'm probably not going to buy into it. I'm probably not going to run the interventions you want me to do. Goals that are self-set or assigned by a credible person. Again, this does not mean somebody with a master's or a doctorate in psychology or ABA or, or you know anything like that. It's somebody that understands the client, somebody that understands the process and the situation, somebody that can have a good relationship to provide you what you need to get through that goal and that intervention. They need to be action-based. They need to have steps to them. They need to guide and direct your behavior. What exactly do I need to do to get through these intervention steps to achieve the goal? There needs to be some sort of connection between why you're doing it and what you're going to get out of it. Humans, <laughs> humans are selfish creatures. They want something out of it. They want to understand what's in it for me. So there needs to be some sort of benefit. You know, you've got that staff that's worked 16 hours that just does not want to run that intervention anymore. They're tired of running it for that day. They need to understand the impact of not running it. They need to understand the impact of running it. If they do run it, there will be a reduction in behaviors. But if they choose not to run it, behaviors are probably going to continue. Tracking the progress of the goal, small increments. We need to see progress. Inherently, we need to see progress. We need to see that what we're doing is making a difference. Um, there was a study for this. Oh, well, think about your campaign posters that you see when people put outside of banks or a library where they're trying to raise money. They've got their campaign posters that have the different levels of where they are versus where they need to get to. You're more likely to donate $5 if you see that they're only $20 away from their end goal. You want to be a part of that achieving the goal. So when you set small increments of progress and you give that visual feedback, your staff are more likely to buy in and do your interventions and you're going to have a good effective goal. Commitment to the goal is created by having all of these other factors in place. Your buy-in, it's easily accessible, it's action-based, and it's obtainable. Task complexity is very similar to your intervention complexity. If the goal is too complex, it's not easily understood. It allows for more errors to be made and staff just get frustrated and overwhelmed and give up. Situational constraints is a huge factor that needs to be looked at when you're setting goals. Don't expect to set, an, a, I use it again, the same example, a dense reinforcement schedule whenever you've got one staff responsible for four clients making dinner, brushing their teeth, doing hygiene, but you've got Bobby over here who needs to be reinforced every two minutes. You need to look at your personnel support. You need to look at your time frame that you need to implement the intervention. And you need to make sure that all those factors are taken into account. I can't stress the importance of not forgetting to look at your situational constraints. I think that's something that's very important because our staff don't see the bigger picture all the time because it is all about how do I make sure I keep my kids safe through the day. And they need you to see that situation as well. So my hypothesis of what we need to do 
is that goals that are set by individuals that are meaningful, important, challenging, and specific, and that have a visual or measurable outcome should be the most effective form of goals. And those are what we really need to strive for when we're talking to our staff and asking them to run complex interventions. Last section is the structured environments, I think is so, so important um, of what we need to do to make sure that interventions are run effectively. Because so often I've sat in meetings and said, well, Bobby's having issues and you want me to do this with Billy and Susie's over here doing this and I've got a staff out in the bathroom with other two kids and it's just chaotic. A lot of our environments are chaotic and a lot of our staff rely on that excuse or that reality of what they should be expected to, to do versus what they actually are doing. Um, and I'm a big believer in being proactive, so in structuring your environment so that you have all those variables and factors accounted for prior to trying to set out a really great intervention that you don't want to fail because you know it's going to give you the outcome that you want. So be proactive, and there's just a couple steps in here for this. Look at your personnel needs. Again, the turnover. Um, from your management and your organizational standpoint, what can you do as an organization to keep your turnover low and your retention high? That's an overarching theme that needs to be looked at. Your individualized treatment plans. Janice talked about it, Karen talked about it, Jason and Shamsi talked about it. Individualizing your interventions to your kids because the same intervention will not solve the same problem across settings or across students. There is no one cookie cutter intervention that will address all issues. Um, individualized feedback and training programs. It's so important that we get away from large group trainings, that we get away from didactic instruction, you tell me what to do and I go do it. We need to have the individualized training programs so that staff feel comfortable running the interventions and understand the interventions. But we also need to have the individualized feedback to make sure that they stay on track. Routines, we talked about it extensively today, that you know we're creatures of habit. It brings about a sense of trust and calming whenever our clients have routines throughout the day. So have your structured schedules up for the day. Do the same thing day in and out. Make sure that you're adjusting it to meet the needs of the kids. Don't have your 45 minute circle time if you know your kids can't sit still for that long. So modify your schedule throughout the day, but give them the supports that keeps it consistent from day to day. Visual supports, timers, and reinforcers. As a teacher, you should have boxes of these in your classroom. So always having things available in case something gets broken or thrown or lost or doesn't come back from the house the night before. That way you're never without what you need to run the interventions. Be proactive. Have it available. All right, so these are the things that you should not do after everything that we, we did. Large group trainings. It doesn't give you the sense of relationship. It doesn't give you the chance to have, it goes against everything that we talked about. It, you don't get the in vivo feedback. You don't get the problem solving. You don't get to role play. You don't get to model. You're simply being sat here and told what to do and what not to do. So this is not the most effective avenue for you guys to learn about this type of information because you might have questions. You, everybody has, I know this kid who does this. You want to answer that question. Um, didactic instruction, being told what to do, it doesn't work. Response dependent feedback. Um, this is defined as sort of, it goes back to the article um, where your integrity fell below a certain level, you were given feedback to bring it back up. There's research out there that says integrity implemented at a 50% level is just as damaging as an intervention implemented at a 0% level. It creates that inconsistency, it creates those unclear expectations, and clients and kids, they just don't know what to do. So you need to have a high level of integrity or you need to have no integrity at all because you're doing more damage by intermittently doing it. So even when you do have the short increase in integrity after feedback, it doesn't remain high. 
So the small increments that the teacher brings it back up to 80%, within one to 10 days, they're probably gonna drop down again, and that's just as damaging because you're fluctuating between 80%, 40%, and that's just not effective either. So you wanna have a routine feedback schedule, an observation schedule. Um, public schools have classroom observation schedules where they do them like three times a year probably, and that's for your teacher evaluations. We should be doing them probably monthly, bi-weekly, for teachers and interventions to make sure that the interventions are staying high and that they're not declining. Um, don't have multi-step complex detailed interventions. It increases your risk for errors. You're less likely to get buy-in and engagement in them. Don't wait to provide feedback. Do it as soon as possible. Um, don't have vague goals dictated by parties that have no relationship. Don't use cookie cutter approaches. We all know individualization is the best way to go, so don't use a first then card for everything. Doesn't serve the purpose, doesn't meet the function of the behavior. So in closing, why does treatment integrity matter? We're life changers for one. We're all in the human services field. We all wanna make things better for the clients that we serve. So why not do it as quick as possible? Why not get on the fast track to treatment and bettering people's lives? Grafton Solutions for Life, Solutions for Living, Solutions for Life. We wanna do that as quick as possible because we wanna get them back to their life. You know, we're in no way a long-term care facility for some of these clients, and we need to do the best we can, the fastest that we can to get them back home, because the longer that they experience trauma, the harder it is to get them out of that rut that they're in and reprogram their neural pathways. Um, intrinsic motivation from the staff part, from, the, from our perspective, you know, we wanna do better. We enter human services because we wanna do better. We wanna change people's lives. Sometimes that's enough, sometimes it's not, but you know, we need to remember that's probably why we got into it in the first place. Um, not to mention the fringe benefits that come with increasing treatment integrity. You've got decreased treatment time, which leads to a decrease in financials. Um, you don't have to put out as much money for treatment. Human services is not cheap by any means. You have an increase in retention because you're reducing the stress of your work environment. Your, out, your research outcomes should produce evidence-based practices if you have high levels of treatment integrity, which makes you then a valid research organization, and I think that's kind of the direction that we've been heading in lately. So we need to make sure that our treatment integrity is good and we're doing what we say we're doing before we publish it and broadcast ourselves. So we really wanna make sure that what we're implementing is being done well and the outcomes that we're getting for our clients are truly based on maybe the principles of ABA or that first then card or you know, whatever intervention we have that works for us, it has to work for the parents too. Uh, what, oops. How do we affect change? So the, the principles we talked about, you know, immediate feedback, in the moment training, individualized training, having accountability and monitoring processes, in place for your staff and your clinical interventions. Know your employees. Don't forget that. Your employees are people too. Our DSPs are some of our most important people that we have because they carry out the work day in and day out. And you really need to know who they are, take care of them, treat them with dignity and respect the same way we treat our clients with dignity and respect. So know them, give them the feedback they deserve so that they can do a better job because some of those people that work 16 hours, they're happy to work 16 hours, not just for the paycheck, but because that's their second home. They love those kids. They treat them like their own. So give them the opportunity to give them a better life and a better outcome. So where do we go from here? Well, we're all in a different part of our organization. Some of us need to better monitor our treatment integrity at the beginning. We need to get better at providing feedback for some of our employees and monitoring our treatment integrity. Once we get there, we need to figure out how to get treatment integrity past three weeks because our meeting schedule just doesn't match up with what research says. And we want to make sure that the integrity stays high from intervention revision to intervention revision so that we can gradually fade the restrictiveness of our intervention so that eventually the kid that needs the one-to-one -one aid can get through the day with a first then card. So 
we got to get past that three-week threshold. <laughs> That's crazy to me. All right, so things to remember, eliminate the barriers, have high buy-in and acceptance from your staff, have proficient coaches and trainers, immediate feedback, goals that are specific and meaningful, and don't forget that three-week threshold. There's all my references and my happy face. Any questions? No questions? Good. Have a great day.